Hey, everybody. How you doing? It's Maria Hinojosa live from my bedroom, which is a makeshift studio. Thankfully, I have a great background because I'm married to the artist Herman Perez, so that always helps. It's so great to be with you. I'm the author of Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. And many of you know me as the anchor of Latino USA and In the Thick um, and other things. And I'm a proud New Yorker, Mexican, Harlemite, immigrant, woman, writer, artist, creator, disruptor. Uh, so let me just go through a few little things first that are housekeeping. And then I've got this amazing panel. So let me do this quick. Okay, so we're broadcasting on Crowdcast. And um, the chat is going to be open. So you should start sending your questions in because we're going to make this as interactive as possible. Put them, <clears throat> there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to go to your questions as soon as you start sending them in. Um, this event is going to be live captioned. Ugh. God, that's hard. Translated into French, Spanish, and Vietnamese. So please see the links in the chat for access to that. Um, we are going to be providing some visual descriptions for visually impaired folks. So enjoy that. Um, right now, just so everybody knows, we are in the fr in a frame on the left side of the screen, and we see branding for Pen America and the Pen World Voices Festival in the corners. And there's a chat with comments on the side where people are telling us where they're watching from. So tell us where you're watching us from. Okay, so tonight um, is a conversation. I told these extraordinary authors to please interrupt each other. Um, and we're gonna start by introducing ourselves and our pronouns and by giving a visual description of what we're wearing so the people um, who need to know what we're wearing and what we look like can do that. So um, my name is Maria Hinojosa. I use she, her uh, pronouns. Tonight, I have my long-ish, black-ish, curly hair, loose. I have big silver earrings uh, made in the form of hearts. I'm wearing a huipil, a Mexican huipil that is uh, hand embroidered and kind of symbolic of my indigenous roots. And I've got like pretty intense red lipstick on because that's how I'm going for it tonight. Nicole, uh, Hannah Jones, Viet Tanyuen, and Imbol Bue. so glad that you are here. And um, Nicole, why don't you start us off introducing yourself and giving a description of what you look like tonight? Gorgeous. <laughs> Hello, um, Maria, and I'm very excited to be on this panel. It feels like we're so close to being able to do these things again in person. Um, just sad that we we are quite there yet. Um, so I am, how would I say? Well, I have bright red hair that is not uh, created in nature. Um, so I, I couldn't even describe as maybe fire engine red hair. Um, that I spend a lot of time keeping this red. It's big and bushy. I wear, I'm wearing matte lipstick that's called Relentlessly Red, which is about the same color as my hair. Um, and just a plain black dress because I'm already colorful enough. So that's <laughs> Nice. Viet. Hi there. Thrilled to be here. I'm Viet Nguyen. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, to describe myself, I'll borrow a line from Charles Yu's very funny National Book Award winning novel, Interior Chinatown, where he describes his main character as the generic Asian man. <laughs> I think I will amend that a little bit by saying I am the very tired looking generic Asian man. Uh, <laughs> short black hair, heavily gelled, uh, and a dark blue blazer and a black t-shirt. <laughs> yes, we're all about the humor. Seriously, if we don't laugh, we'll cry. So thank you for that. Imbolo, you're looking gorgeous tonight, my dear. <laughs> thank you. Hi, everybody. I guess I am the generic African immigrant woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I have a head wrap on, purple head wrap. Sorry, I should start from the beginning. My name is Imbolo Mbwe. I, uh, my pronouns are she and her. I have a yellow blouse on because yellow is my favorite color and a purple head wrap and I'm wearing glasses and I have in uh, my headset, white headsets because my family gets noisy sometimes so it's good to block them off completely. <laughs> and actually, that's a good thing actually. So where are you tonight in Bolo? I, I, am in, uh, I am in the Hudson Valley of New York right now. Sweet. Yes. Uh, Nicole, Brooklyn? 
No, I'm actually in Chicago and I'm in the, the upper room of a bar because I had another event tonight. Uh, so if you hear music, I'll, I'll well, you know, it's called the other great. All right, my hometown. All right. I, I know all the great places to eat. So if you want to talk food, Chicago, we can do that. And Viet, where are you tonight? Beautiful tree line, Pasadena, California. All right. Okay. Picture of America right there. Um, <laughs> So we're talking history, we're talking about our right to take and tell and own this country's history, which for some of us is our adopted country. Um, at least that's how I see it myself. So I was thinking about my own sense of history in this country. And I think I knew growing up in the late 1960s that I was witnessing history because there were assassinations of John F. Kennedy, of Robert F. Kennedy, of Martin Luther King. And so I, I knew that there was something very intense happening that was historical. But I think the first moment in history where I had like literally an aha moment or where history felt like in this country was when we watched Roots on television. It was a national moment. Everybody was watching it. And, it was finally another side of this history, which we had never you know, seen um, in our history books. And I'm wondering, Nicole, let's start with you in terms of a moment where you kind of were like, wow, uh, American history, this is, when did it happen? When is a moment where it was like for you, like, wait a second, something else is happening in, in this history. And I got a whole other perspective than what I'm being told. Hmm. Um, so that's a hard question for me because I was a very odd, um, very nerdy child. And um, I always was really obsessed with history. I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't. My, my dad and I used to read the newspaper together when I was a kid. I got my first letter to the editor published in 1988 when <laughs> I was 11 years old and Jesse Jackson was running um, for presidency and he didn't do well in the Iowa primary. And I thought that was because my fellow Iowans were being racist. So I say all that to say that I just wasn't, I've always really thought about um, history and who, why, why weren't we there? But if I, if I were to think about a particular moment that I think was really transformative in my understanding of history, it would have been as a high school student when my high school offered a one semester black studies course. It was an elective because, you know, the, color, the history of people of color is it's optional, um, you can take it or not. Um, and in that class, I became really obsessed because all, all of a sudden in three months, I was learning more about the history of black people and uh, uh, black people in Africa before we came to America than I'd gotten in my entire K-12 education. Um, and that class really started making me realize that the history we've been taught was not actually just the facts of what happened, it was curated and someone had chosen to tell us certain stories and chosen to leave out most of the world and most of the contributions of the people who weren't white. Um, and just taking that class and seeing in three months, um, I, I was kind of embarrassed because I, I, was, I, I didn't even know there were all these books about black people. I didn't even know we had done all of these things that we could learn about because I think when you're a kid, you assume there was importance, your educators would have taught you, or when you go to the museum, it would be in the museum, or it would be in the newspaper. And it was, it was in that class that I realized that just wasn't true. People had made choices to erase us, and to erase indigenous people, and to erase Asian people, uh, and to erase Latinos, and that that was a choice. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, I think, when it was. So um, thank you, Nicole. Um, and for squeezing us in at the top of a bar or someplace in Chicago. Um, look, Viet, um, you know, for me, I have realized that the first televised refugee crisis was actually with the Vietnamese people. Um, and this, this also marked me because I didn't understand why we, why this country, I was in the south side of Chicago. I'm like, wait a second, there's a lot of space in this country. People need help. Why are, why does this country say, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, your, but then they don't. It was another moment in history that again, I was living through. Um, but for you, when was that 
was there a particular moment that you're like, wow, the it kind of cracked, the mirror cracked? Well, I think my experience was very similar to Nicole's. I, you know, I, I was always a nerd reading a lot of newspapers. I was aware of things that were happening, like the Iran hostage crisis when it was taking place when I was like seven or eight years old. But for me, history really came alive when I went to school at Berkeley. Um, and, you know, up until that point, you know, I was aware that I had been shaped by history, the history that you're alluding to, the, the, the refugee crisis from Vietnam and, and then before that, the war in Vietnam. But as a young person, I'd been only exposed to that through mass media images, Hollywood movies, for example, and then the mainstream news reporting on the so-called boat people. And so for me growing up, to be Vietnamese meant to be a victim. Like this is what we, this is what we were given, you know, like Hollywood war movies, we were there to be killed, to be raped, to be okay. silenced. Or to be rescued and that was our fate as the so-called boat people of the mainstream media as well and then to go to berkeley i was completely radicalized the moment i stepped foot on campus and discovered that there was such a, such a population as asian americans and that we had asian american history that i had never been taught about it got me very very angry and very very passionate and my fellow asian americans and i we were all 19 or 20 years old really believed we could change the world at that point that we could be engaged both in sort of an intellectual transformation in the classroom but we could get out into the streets which meant the campus of berkeley and try to protest and you know, uh, engage in political movement in imitation of our of our forebears from the 1960s of the asian american political alliance and the third world uh, liberation front from the bay area and so that was our initiation into the idea that we could try to change history and as for me i took that in a very particular direction of trying to become not only an activist, but a writer. You know, here we are talking about telling stories and it's so crucial to tell our stories in the face, for my, in my experience, of looking at how the Vietnamese and Asians in general were being portrayed. And nothing has changed. There was a study that just came out today uh, or yesterday that said that um, Asian Americans, of course, and Asians have very few you know, roles in Hollywood. And 25% of the time, we die. Okay, so we die pretty much. Maybe it's a little bit of improvement because I think wow. maybe it's like 50%, you die. So we have a slight degree of improvement. Whoa, that's deep. And you know, um, I, I, I will never forgive my colleagues in the mainstream media for labeling the Vietnamese people survivors of trauma and war boat people. And I feel like there should be a public apology for ever using that term and it, it should be banned because what that would mean is that that mainstream papers would now be referring to refugees from Central America who are sleeping on the streets of Matamoros, et cetera, in Mexico, that they would then be referred to as concrete people or sidewalk people. It's, um, it's offensive. So... Um, that, and that's a, a, a kind of moment when we're able to um, take our history back and challenge, right? Use our voices. So Imbolo, what's going on? You look very pensive and I'm wondering for you what you're thinking about in terms of the moment for you where it, it was like, yeah, this history thing, it's more complicated than we're being taught in our books. Hmm. Well, so I, I did not grow up in America. I, I didn't come here till I was college age. I came here to go to college in the late nineties. and. And before I came here, I didn't know much about American history, obviously. I, um, I think what I knew was mostly about Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. I don't know why we were taught that, but that was something that we taught. Um, I didn't know anything about the civil rights movement. I never heard about it. I didn't know about what happened to Native Americans. Um, it was only when I came here, and it's interesting because I, I learned a lot of American history and literature, right? That is how I learned about for example, like Julio Sukas' book, The Buddha in the Attic, that is what I, when I learned about what happened to the Japanese. Um, uh, just many other novels I can't think about right now that showed me different elements of American history. Uh, but I think for me, a turning point was when I read the, um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, because I had, um, I don't know, me because growing up in my town, there were a lot of young people who had Malcolm X t-shirts. And I was always curious why, Every, all these young people in my town, they thought it was cool to have these t-shirts with Malcolm X, who in the world is Malcolm X? And then I came to America and I read that, that um, the, his autobiography with Alex Haley, and I was very, very fascinated um, by, by elements of American history that I'd never even considered. Obviously, being coming to America uh, as a teenager, I had an idea of this altogether wonderful place, right? America was was a sort of glorious place where, you know, 
people from Africa come here and they make a lot of money and go back home and they flaunt their riches. And I came here and I discovered it was um, it was far more complex than that. Yeah. So um, you bring up Alex Haley. Alex Haley is the person who wrote Roots, who that was this TV series that kind of, again, finally put um, the history of slavery through a certain interpretation. Um, he, he's complicated in and of itself. But the, the question I want to ask you, the three of you, Nicole, um, and remember, you can interrupt. OK, just saying you can interrupt. Um, so. I was, I was asked what was the most difficult part of writing my memoir, which is a historical memoir. And I was like writing the history of the United States because I didn't feel like I had the right. Like I was like, I wasn't born in this country. I'm not a PhD historian. You know, I'm not an expert and I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't write this. In fact, it's the part that was the most liberating and kind of me coming to terms with the history of this country regarding its treatment of immigrants. Um, so it's the role of our responsibility. I mean, Nicole, you are a heroine to so many people. I know that you don't walk around, especially because you have a daughter, so so you can never walk around thinking you're all that because you have a daughter who's going to take you down. We know this, but really? but what about this notion of our responsibility to to tell these stories, to right these wrongs, to be you know, a, a role model as a writer. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, the only reason I ever wanted to become a writer was to have some control over the narrative of my people, right? To not simply let someone else who wasn't um, of our community, who wasn't accurately rendering our communities, be be the ones who have the final say on who we are. That's that's why I wanted to be a journalist. So I've never been uh, one of those journalists who um, says I, I don't want to be a black journalist. I just want to be a journalist. Being black defines everything about the work that I do. Why I wanted to do this work and the lens through which I write the story. So. Um, you know, I, I was kind of joking when you said I'm a heroine. I, I don't think I'm a heroine. I, I think I just do the work that I want to do. And I'm certainly a villain to a lot of people right now. You can catch me uh, on Fox News at least once a week. Um, but what it shows is, is that um, controlling the narrative is about power. And we have been excluded from having the power to actually shape the way that we think about our country and we think about the different roles people have played in it. And so when you you challenge that power and you challenge it in a successful enough way, um, that is going to, of course, bring a lot of people who want to take that power back. And when I think about all of the writers that are in this conversation today, each one, I mean, yet like your, your book, this is similar to what Mbolo said, I, I learned so much more about um, the Vietnam conflict reading your book than I ever learned in history or from the movies. Um, and I think for many Americans who we don't get global history, we don't get a good history of the United States, um, fiction and writing is the way that we, that we actually are able to fill in a lot of those gaps. And that is about power. That is about who gets to ultimately decide how we think about ourselves um, and how we think about each other. Viet, um, what about you? I mean, I, I, I agree with you, Nicole. You're just like, I'm not, a, I'm not a hero. I'm just doing my job. I totally get that. But what I'm trying to say is that you are a model for many of us because you stood up and you fought to get this coverage. You fought, a, you fought to tell this story. You did not take no as an answer. And in that sense, um, you are a tremendous inspiration to many journalists, young or not. Um, Viet, this notion of um, of a sense of responsibility um, to tell these truths, uh, I mean, are you thinking about that as you're writing or are you just saying, I've got to tell these truths, this is the story that I can tell because it's the story that I know? Well, I think both things are happening, you know, and I think one of the things that Nicole made clear in, in her description of her own work and the reception of the 1619 Project is that stories are really actually very important. I mean, we live in a culture, on the one hand, very materialist culture, which, which tells us stories are not important. You should use STEM instead. But on the other hand, our conflicts are so much about the stories that define 
what this country is supposed to be. And if we grow up absorbing a certain kind of story, it becomes completely embedded in our minds. That's what, that's what we call ideology. And once that story is completely embedded in our minds, it's impossible, really difficult for us to see other kinds of realities, other kinds of, of alternatives. And so that's where the interventions of storytellers, whether we take the guise of a journalist or a, a novelist or, or something else, becomes really crucial because we can see that once we puncture someone's most basic story, they freak out, right? And, you know, so, and I, I think about how I feel like I didn't have a choice in the story that I wanted to tell. I mean, I really wanted to tell the story of my, my people, the Vietnamese refugees, but also Vietnamese people in Vietnam and the war, because they were crucially important to me. And I think that's where so many of us as storytellers start. We start with what is crucially important to us emotionally and, 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 and politically. And the fact of the matter is, the reason why a personal story becomes important for everybody is because we're all connected. You know, we live in a society in which we are told if you come from a so-called minority, your story is not important because you, you're just a part of some small fraction of people. But in fact, if I just look at my own experience, you know, Vietnamese people were crucially important to the United States because of this terrible war that the United States fought in Vietnam, which tells us everything we need to know about the United States. And so does everything else. How the United States treats particular populations tells us everything we need to know about the United States. So if you're a storyteller and you're focused on a very particular story, you shouldn't be swayed from doing that by people telling you it's not relevant. It is in fact relevant if you can make, or if you can clarify the connections that are implicitly there. Last thing I'll say, you know, we're living through a period of anti-Asian violence. A lot of it is due to stories. You know, we got this previous administration saying, COVID-19 is the Kung flu and the China virus. That is a horrific story that's being perpetrated. And all my Asian American brothers and sisters out there, um, you know, parents of kids and all that, I know you want your kids to be doctors and lawyers and engineers. I get it. But doctors and lawyers and engineers aren't going to save us <laughs> at this moment. It's the storytellers who are going to give us a fighting chance against <laughs> these kinds of depictions. Mm -hmm. You said, you said I, to interrupt, and I just want to say, like, oh. that's so true. And I'm, I, I, I just appreciate you framing it in that way. Um, you actually framed it better than me because I'm talking about power, but power is about narrative and narrative is what makes us think about our country and each other in a certain way. And, and you're absolutely right that um, who controls that narrative and this, there shouldn't be one, but who controls that narrative controls the way that we think about each other in our society. So thank you for making that point. <laughs> I mean, what's what we have to realize is that um, right now in the United States of America, and I would say really much of the Western world, but it, certainly in the United States, the mainstream media, books, mag magazines, television, uh, podcasting, newspapers, the buck stops with white, straight, cis men of privilege who present heterosexual. There it's where the buck stops. Like they ultimately are the the owners of the means of production, which is why, um, you know, I took over the means of production and created my own. That was one way to deal with it. Um, Imbolo, um, I'm wondering about your sense of, um, you know, being now a writer, you know, in this country and, um, and how you navigate this notion of responsibility um, by the way, we did get our first question. So I want to integrate the question to you, Mbolo, because I do want our audience to feel like you're a part of the conversation. Otherwise, what's good with a Zoom? So plus, I love the fact that our first question is going to come from a high schooler. So who, you, Meryl, as a high schooler, you got this. Because if you're out there asking a question to this group, you're going to go far in life. So right on. Okay. As a high school student of color, I've read all of the speakers books in class. Bravo. Do you all have any advice for aspiring writers of color? I love that. It's a huge question, but Mbolo, let's just take you um, as an, what's your piece of advice to a young high schooler who's, who's wants to be a writer? Yeah, good for you. Um, like Viet says, we <laughs> we need writers now more than ever. Um, but I, I think that you know the, the, uh, what both Viet and, and Nicole said about telling the story that matters to you and your people, um, it's really crucial advice. I remember when I, I got the inspiration to write my first novel, um, Behold the Dreamers, 
And I thought to myself, you know, how many people know Cameroon, right? Cameroon is a very small country on the west coast of Africa. When I tell people I'm from Cameroon, they say, where is that? I mean, most people don't even know where it is. And I say, it's right next to Nigeria. And they say, oh, we know Nigeria, because everybody knows Nigeria. Uh, so I, I, I thought to myself, who wants to read about a Cameroonian immigrant family, you know, during the financial crisis? And I also wondered whether um, I, I had a right, a right to write about um, the financial crisis because that was a pretty big moment, the financial crisis in American history. And my, my first novel was focused, uh, centered around two families, one immigrant family, the other one uh, an American family dealing with the financial crisis. And, it was, um, and, I, and I thought as if maybe that is something that a, a, you know, a real American writer should write about. At that point, I wasn't even an American citizen. I, I had a green card. Uh, but, I, but I said to myself, you know, this is, this is my country too. Even though I wasn't a citizen at that time, I was, I was about to become a citizen. I thought that it was, um, it was my responsibility to tell the story that mattered to me because um, the story was very connected to my, me wrestling with America, um, me wrestling with, with the idea of what I thought America was if I came here and me wrestling with what I saw when I got here. Um, and so I... I, I, I was very, um, I mean, I, I wish I'd listened to people like Vied and Nicole before, at that point because I would have, I would have had more, um, more, more, uh, more courage to do it. Maybe I would have, you know, written it a lot faster. But I certainly, um, I, I, I told myself that I have to tell the story about people like myself, um, immigrants who come here really believing that America is, is a sort of, sort of promised land and find that it is far more complicated. And so that is the advice I give to, to young people, that you have to tell the story that matters to you. Um, I mean, I love stories that open, expose me to new worlds. I just, you know, that is the wonderful thing about American literature right now. There's just so much about worlds that I hadn't thought about imagining, new places and ideas. And, and maybe the publishing world might not love it, um, but you never know. And, and I also think that you shouldn't really focus on on what the world wants to read. You, you don't really know what the world wants to read, right? I, I think you should focus on what you want to tell and, and let, you know, you know, leave it at that and just put the book out there and see what happens. That's great advice. advice. And uh, say, I wish you could, I, I, I can you also advice. That's a great high school if you're reading all, all of these books. <laughs> I have a little Agreed. bit of advice to offer because, you know, um, on the one hand, I think you're free to write about whatever you want. So, you know, you shouldn't feel constrained that you should only write about your particular experience or your family or your community, whatever that happens to be. You just got to do research mm -hmm. and, and you can write about anything. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that at the same time, the reverse is also true. But I, I grew up thinking that no one wanted to hear the stories of my family because uh, we were just, you know, unimportant people living in San Jose, California. My parents were running a grocery store. Who cares about something like that? But I think what's important to know is that every story counts. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that really matters is how you tell the story. I mean, there are boring stories and non-boring stories, but it's not the content. It's how you deal with it that matters. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did a conversation with the filmmaker, Lee Isaac Chung, the director of Minari, which is a great movie about uh, a, you know an, a Korean immigrant family in Arkansas trying to run a farm based on his family's life. And he said, you know, he, he didn't want to tell this story for decades and decades because who cares about a Korean immigrant family mm -hmm. trying to run a farm in Arkansas? And so he, he wanted to do other movies, but he returned to this. And it's obviously the movie that people most resonate with because from this very particular experience, he extracted this, this beautiful uh, emotional account. And that's, that's within all of us. And I think that's where the, the true story lies, you know, is you finding the emotions within yourself uh, to tell your story and make other people feel it. I was going to say, Nicole, as I hand it off to you, in case you want to give a couple of words to advice to another high schooler, because I know you know a little bit about high schoolers. This notion of like what Imbolo said about like, it's, I'm not a real American. I mean, I think that this is like the thing, you know, the same thing, Imbolo. I was like, but I'm not a real American. And it's like, no, this is the real America. And, and our stories are not immigrant stories or black stories or i mean they are these are american stories mm -hmm. yeah we want to they want to label us as somehow or minority stories a word you will never hear in any of the media that we produce and it's like no y'all don't get to label it like this jump <laughs> in Nicole. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, one, the advice I would give to any young writer is read writers, read great writers, right? Like all of us read great writing and you study it, you study um, structure of the sentence, the tension, storytelling. So any anyone, no matter what your background is, if you want to read, if you want to be a great writer, you have to read how great writers write. Um, and in terms of identity, I mean, I think every person of color struggles with that idea of, of what is an American? And my opening essay for the 1619 Project is really grappling with this idea that many Black Americans feel like we live in a country that we can't claim, that we are citizens of this country, but we don't feel like citizens of, of this country. And in some ways, Black Americans often feel like we are without country because we're in a country that we were never intended to exist as citizens. Um, we've had to fight for identity and feel a very conflicted feeling about patriotism, the flag, all of those sorts of things. Um, and what I realized in researching the essay is no one has a right to deny us, any of us, the legacy of the country that we helped to build and that we are helping to build. Um, this is again, why narrative and storytelling is so important because when people make us feel that this is not our country, uh, it denies that almost everyone here except indigenous people uh, immigrated from elsewhere and that um, this has never been a white man's country. This has been a multiracial nation uh, since 1619 when um, black people came in a country that was being founded by white people on land and nations that already existed with indigenous people, right? So this has always been a multiracial country. This has never been a white man's country, but we have allowed people to make us feel we can't uh, claim ownership over a country full of immigrants, full of descendants of immigrants, and that has always had uh, different people of color. Right, um, and if you flip it, and trigger warning, just for everybody, I'm about to say something that Many of you are going to perceive as offensive, but that's why I'm saying it. So, but okay, here's, here's it is. So if history were written from the perspective of the indigenous people, right, of this land, they would say that the first, to use an offensive term, illegal aliens that arrived here would be the pilgrims. <laughs> and then if you just think that, it just like really flips your head or the fact that the first official settler that we know of to actually arrived to Southern Florida and spoke Spanish and that the second settlement was in New Mexico in Nuevo Mexico. So Spanish was being spoken here along with indigenous. So all of these things that, again, we don't know because I don't know, white men just kind of decided they get to tell it all and get to be the ones who own objectivity. It's fabulous for them. Okay. We have gotten a bunch of questions. So here's what I'm going to do, my dear panelists. I'm going to read several of the questions because that way the audience knows that we're actually listening to them. And then you can kind of mix it up in your questions as you interrupt each other. All right. So I'm going to shorten the questions. Um, in the Academy, peer reviewers are so powerful that they can change your argument and get away with it. How have you negotiated gatekeepers who somehow try to tell you, you know, oh, your perspective has to be changed and we're the gatekeeper. So that's one question. Um, what are helpful or unhelpful ways to write fiction from a position of structural power about characters who don't all embody such privileges? Okay. Um, and question. Criminal injustice has long bloody roots. I'm torn between writing and activism. I know writing is fighting, but too often I must put down the pen to act and my writing time suffers. How hmm. have you handled this dilemma? All right, jump in, my dear panelists. Those were from some pretty meaty questions. Those are incredible <laughs> questions, oh my gosh. Um, you know, with the gatekeeping issue, since I'm an academic and I've been through the peer review system, um, that, that question is absolutely right. But, you know, my strategy is uh, it's always a strategic issue. Like, how do you survive? I and mean, that's the first, the first problem. You have to survive long enough so that you have the power to do something yourself for the next generation or your colleagues and so on. So if you, in fact, you're, if, if you're going up for peer review or the equivalent the first time, you have to you know, suck it up and, and bear it and, and do what you have to do to get your book published so that you can get tenure. And so you have the capacity to do exactly what you wanna do. And if, if you have that power, I think what's really important to note for me is 
we, we shouldn't, there should be no such thing as gatekeepers. We should just be opening the gates and letting people in. There should be no such thing as a voice for the voiceless. None of us should be aspiring to, to be somebody to be somebody's representative. We should be, you know, aspiring to abolish the conditions of voicelessness. Um, that relates to the activism question. For me, I, I have the same conundrum that the uh, the questioner had, and I'm always trying to figure out the, the balance between writing and activism and teaching. Um, but they're they're but they're crucial to do it together, um, because for me, again, if if there if the activists didn't exist, I wouldn't exist as a writer. I couldn't have written my books, for example, if there hadn't been, you know, literally a century of Asian American activists and writers already struggling and already writing before me to set the conditions by which I could write my books. I what I wasn't the first person uh, to say what I had to say. And so, uh, you know, no matter what you're doing, I think that's, that's really, really crucial. When you become successful, you cannot put, position yourself as the first, as the only, as the gatekeeper. You really have to Think of your work in solidarity with so many other uh, people out there. Mm, that's beautiful. Anybody, Nicole and Bola, you want to jump into one of the, answer one of those questions, or we can also move on. I've forgotten all of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nicole, oh, there, we have another question that um, actually is really interesting. It says, um, um, "Well, actually, I really want to um, acknowledge the fact that tonight." <clears throat> as we are here with the freedom to talk about art and writing, even though many of us feel attacked at different moments in this country, but there are people, our fellow human beings um, right now in Gaza um, who are scared. There are journalists who are being attacked. There are mothers who are frightened for their children. And, um, and there are writers who are probably writing um, under extreme duress and yet trying to capture this moment. So we want to send our thoughts and, um, and solidarity with all of them and, um, and not just our thoughts, but our actions um, and what we're going to do in this country. Um, as a writer, how do you touch on social issues and political tensions without being biased and staying with the facts? Uh, what's your advice for Latino, young Latino writers and how to get our work out there? Um, don't stop is what I'm saying. That's all I can say is just don't stop. Be a queen or a king of never giving up. Um, Nicole, can you talk about this notion of the bias or not trying to show bias um, and how we as journalists of color and of conscience deal with that question? Well, I mean, I think the notion of not showing bias or trying to bias is bullshit. Like, um, all of us are biased, we're human beings. And this idea that a uh, white lens is an objective lens, that they are not reporting and writing from their racialized and genderized experience, but that people of color somehow are, uh, is ludicrous, right? So I I'm not gonna pretend that um, I'm objective about inequality. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm objective about segregation. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm objective about any of the things that I cover. The journalist, which is different, of course, from a fiction writer or is different from an opinion writer or, well, opinion writers can be journalists, but as a, uh, a nonfiction writer, the facts are never an issue. Um, but what is important to me is objectivity of method. So when I'm writing, I'm clearly marshalling facts to make an argument, but am I being fair? Are my facts accurate? Uh, am I am I as accurately as possible presenting the argument? I, I think we have to really get away from this idea of objectivity. Nothing about the industry I'm in is objective. Um, what, you know, look at the newsrooms. They don't reflect the populations they cover. Uh, the newspaper on any given day in any community is about power. It's not actually about what's happening in the lives of everyday people. Uh, the decisions about who we interview, what gets on the front page, how much space it gets, how we start the story, those are all subjective decisions. So I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to purge yourself of humanity, which is to say I you can be uh, unbiased in your writing, but instead ensuring that um, you are being objective in your methodology as much as possible. Um, that's all that I strive for, and I'm very honest about that. Agreed. Well, thank you and for that. <laughs> that's very honest, well. Nicole. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, um, I, I mean, it's different for for a novelist. I mean, for for me, I, um, it's funny because people people ask me a lot about my books and what um what was my goal, right? What were you trying to say in this in this in this 
story. And I think that for me, I um, like I really try to not have an agenda when I tell a story, except to just tell the story. Um, and I, I'm not sure why, maybe because I am just so focused on on presenting the characters, and I and I hope that 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 does you know that does a job. Um, but it's so refreshing to say to hear you say that that you know as a journalist you're not um, because there's been so much bias against you against people like you, and you know your job is not to um, to sort of um, perpetrate that by also trying to you know give more advantage to the other side. Um, but I'm curious about what how it works for Viet because I, um, I I really struggle with the idea of having an agenda. I struggle with the idea of having a point. I mean, my my latest novel is about um, an African African villagers fighting an American oil company that has been polluting their land. And people say to me, "Were you trying to show the dangers of capitalism and oh uh, oil exploration? How awful it is?" And I just don't, you know, I just haven't got it to that point yet, you know, I just haven't. Well, I think that, you know, part of, part of what happens in terms of having an agenda is being aware of like what the kind of story you choose to tell and mm -hmm. who you put into your books right. or who you put into your movies, right? So, you know, as, as many of us have said, we live in a multicultural diverse reality. And yet if you watch Hollywood movies, you, you would never understand that because they're focused on white people in, in, in Connecticut or something like that. So simply by setting your novel as you have done in the context of this village under this you know pressure from an oil company it's already to a certain extent a political statement by bringing visibility to the very to the sort of dynamic the sort of story that wouldn't get told in the first place but so far as an agenda goes i think whether we're talking about nonfiction or fiction it's important to have a, a, to have principles and to know <laughs> what principles are right so for example in, in my novel the committed like it's about vietnamese people for the most part in france but i'm very careful to include other characters like senegalese moroccans algerians uh, Algerian uh, Algerian gangsters, because these people also live in Paris as well. It's not I'm not making stuff up to include people in this story, but by not including people in a story, you are in fact engaging in a political agenda of the so-called objectivity. And the last thing is, I'm also uh, I'm not a journalist, but I'm an essayist for the New York Times and other places. Sometimes I'm just required to give an opinion, but the opinion is is driven by I think by principles, and you have to know what these principles are. So I think I talked a lot about Asian American issues, for example, but I talked. Try to tell Asian American people, look, it's not just about us. I write about Asian American issues not just out of self-interest, but out of a principle mm -hmm. of anti-racism and solidarity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that yeah, I have to speak up when Asian people are getting attacked. I have to speak up when other people are getting attacked on the same principle. So for a lot of Asian Americans, for example, we, we, we absolutely believe that the Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II deserved redress and reparations from the United States government for, for what was done to them. But if we believe in that, we have to believe in re reparations for black people too, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, what you know, with what's happening with terms of anti-Asian violence and stuff, and now like Palestine, as Maria already brought up, I've, I've tried to speak out about that too, but it, because I think it's absolutely crucial for Asian Americans and other people who have been victimized to speak out on the behalf of other colonized people who are being subjected to unequal degrees of state violence and oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the principle, you know, that I think that, that that I hope that I stand for and that I that I try to articulate in uh, in my work, so that it's not just about being for your own population, but standing for something. And that's more important to me than objectivity. All right, so you, you happened yet to bring up Connecticut. I don't know why, but you did, and you brought up white people. I'm just gonna give you a little piece of data though. So in every little district in Connecticut, whatever it is that it's broken up to, hamlets or towns, there's at least one Puerto Rican in every single hamlet district in all of Connecticut. And people don't understand Connecticut, Pennsylvania, those are Latino states increasingly. Um, and so it's like, aha, uh -huh, Connecticut, you think it's just white people. It's actually much more complex than that. But listen, <laughs> y'all. Like Bill Roth lived in Connecticut or whatever. <laughs> you know, but you know, in your, from your example, I'll also add, you know, o Ocean Bloom's novel, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, is set in Hartford, Connecticut. White oh, yeah. Connecticut and queer Vietnamese boy have an affair in Hartford, Connecticut. I know those oh. stories. But they're not Absolutely. the stories that are told, being told unless we tell them. Absolutely. Listen, we have got such a smart audience. I'm telling you, the questions now have come in like, so I, I we're wrapping up, right? We've only got like 13 minutes left. 
But let me just read a couple of these. Um, this one actually was pretty beautiful. It said, um, I'd love to hear from all the panelists about what writers they consider great and who has influenced their writing. That's an easy one. Um, I love this one. Related to the question about structural violence and whiteness. Hi, I am watching with my mom, Diane. I'm in eighth grade. And I was wondering how I can be an activist and ally. I've been telling my teachers that we have too many white male heroes journey stories in the curriculum. Bravo, you watching with your mom, Diane. <laughs> Always engage with your teacher and have, um, they may not appreciate it, but keep on going. Okay, uh, perhaps two, okay, let's see. Um, and then when somebody was asking if we can give our input on what's happening in Colombia, um, given that we brought up what's happening in Palestine. And it is quite sad uh, for me to see that um, Latin America is increasingly using the tactics that they are watching the United States use to repress their own people. Not that this isn't new um, in, in our countries, but certainly the, there is a, an imprimatur now of the United States having done it. And it's like everybody else can do it two. Um, all right. Anybody want to jump in on any of those questions? Um, uh, Nicole, who are the writers that you love to read and that inspire you? And actually, I'm going to throw another question that was kind of up there, which is, is there somebody in American history that you just always turn to? I'll tell you mine. It's Frederick Douglass and it's Harriet Tubman. But who do you turn to in American history? So great writers that inspire you and who you turn to in American history when you need that moment of inspiration, Nicole, go. God, that's such a hard question because I always feel like I'm I'm gonna leave out really important writers. But uh, one, I you know I'm I'm a lay historian. I'm a, I'm a lover of history. So uh, Frederick Douglass is is actually one of the greatest, not just orators, but writers our country has ever produced. Uh, w. E. B. Du Bois. You can read everything that he's written, and it still applies to our society today. Uh, Baldwin, of course, uh, Zora, Neale, Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and I would say uh, fiction writers, be, Zora was both, um, but fiction writers would definitely be Edward P. Jones. Um, one of my favorite books of all time is The Known World. It's one of the few books I've read twice that's not a historical text. Um, and then Isabel Wilkerson, whom I stalked into becoming my friend. I think The Warmth of Other Sons is the most beautiful um, she, book I've ever read. She worked on it for 10 years. She interviewed more than a thousand people. Um, and what was so subversive about that text outside of how beautiful it was, was she placed the black American migration uh, into uh, the realm of the classic immigration story and allowed uh, immigrants who fled their homeland to um, coming to America, seeking a better life to see themselves in the black American story, except black people were having to flee our own homeland for another part of our homeland, uh, seeking uh, the American dream as well. So but those would be my top. Oh, that's, you know, in, in many ways, Nicole, my family lived that story because my mother and father, immigrants from Mexico became best friends with migrants from Mississippi who became, had become professionals in Chicago. And they, my parents learned from them about civil rights and that they had to speak up, that my father had to fight for his tenure yes. or else he would never get it. And it was the most beautiful. And thank you for kind of putting it in that context. That was really quite beautiful. Um, okay, Viet, any, you want to throw some, some names out there? Well, I was just, you know, everything that Nicole said, I, I totally <laughs> endorse the black Latino literary tradition. I, I will also say I love Edward P. Jones. I've, I've met the man. He's wonderful. And I'm going to make a pitch for his book, Lost in the City. It's a collection of short stories, which I think is one of the great short story collections. And people don't read enough short stories. Read Lost in the City. It's fantastic. Um, I would also add uh, from that tradition, you know, obviously, Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison. I, I love Ralph Ellison so much. I named my firstborn son after Ellison. And uh, <laughs> outside of that, Melville, Faulkner. Um, who were also important for, for Toni Morrison uh, as well. For me personally, also, you know, Dostoevsky, he's crazy. Um, his characters are crazy, totally fits my <laughs> world. Maxine Hong Kingston, my teacher at, at, at UC Berkeley, author of The Woman Warrior, Chinaman, books that are so incredibly important. Uh, she's such a great teacher uh, and writer, so impressive. I fell asleep in her class every single day. Uh, <laughs> I was 19 years old. Just goes to show you can have a really bad start and still a writer. So you know, don't, don't knock yourself out if you're not demonstrating tremendous talent at this, uh, this point in your life. 
I love that. Thank you. Imbolo. Yeah, I, I love The Warmth of Many Sons. That is one of my favorite books also. I am. Um, so I, I grew up within a lot of African writers. So the great African writer Ngugi Wationgo, that's one of my favorite writers. He certainly um, shaped a lot of my writing and inspired it. Um, but I didn't ever dream of becoming a writer until I read Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. And that was a book that I finished writing it. I, I finished reading it and I just started writing. And I started writing a novel that just came out recently. Um, so, um, so, Tony Morrison certainly. Um, I am a big fan of American writers who write about immigrants as well. So Juno Diaz, Jumpa Lariri, um, all of those writers certainly um, played a big role in, in inspiring me. And, and I, I just want to say, about, no, I'm sorry. I, I meant as soon. I told you as soon as we did this, I was going to miss a writer. What he taught me with his writing. So he's using all these Dominican terms, right? And I don't know what they are, and he doesn't explain them. I love right. that because I feel like we're often like translating for our white or non-Spanish speaking or non whatever language it is, our native language, um, because we feel we have to. And he actually wrote a book where he's like, if you get it, you get it. I'm writing for my people. If you don't, you don't. And I had to Google terms. It was taking me to a lot of uh, sex sites because a lot of terms I, I learned were, were sexual terms. But that's, that, that really set uh, such a powerful example for me that we can yeah. write to our interior and bring in a bigger audience, but we don't always have to translate for people outside of ourselves. Sorry. Yeah, I'll get, for, some, for, 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 for some reason, while you were saying that, I thought of Sapphire and Push, which is just like um, a, a, a kind of very extraordinary um, story as well. Mbolo, you wanted to say something, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that it was the same for me with Juno Diaz. It was uh, it's really my first novel because I, I, I just admired how he was so unapologetic in um, Oscar Wow in, in writing, you know, as, as if he was writing to other you know, Spanish speakers and they didn't care to translate anything. Um, so that was certainly the same. It's, it's interesting that for me, um, two writers that really had an impact on me couldn't be more different. So it turns out that I was born the same year and the same day, I don't know about the time, that Ernest Hemingway took his own life, July 2nd, 1961. And when I read Hemingway in high school was, I was like, oh, I can write, he writes short, simple sentences that are kind of clear. I can write like this. And it made me think that maybe I could write. And also my muse um, and girlfriend and, and BFF Sandra Cisneros um, in her writing that just made me believe that there was also another way of, of handling language. Um, okay, this is a really interesting question. We've got five minutes left. Um, although you all did not answer about who is your favorite American historical character that you turn to for love and support when you need it. So I'm going to throw that one out there. But here's a question. When I'm writing my stories, I'm always hunt haunted by the issue of justice to the characters I'm creating. I always ask myself, am I being fair to their perspectives and their lives? This is especially for those characters I do not like and those who represent people who were hideous to me as I grew up or are still hideous to me even now. How do you deal with this ethical issue? Oh my God, that's like a <laughs> banger of a question to end with. That's a big one. You can try that or you can give me who's your favorite historical character and statue that you go to pray to when you're not feeling so good. Oh, I'll answer the artistic question. I think that, of course, as, as a writer, you know, one of our most important tools is empathy. So we have to empathize with everybody, including the villains and the people we don't like, and, and all of that. If we're talking about if we're talking about writing realist fiction, I think that's an important constraint here. So, I mean, I have, in fact, actually thought about what would it mean to write a novel from the perspective of our former president. If I were to do that, I would have to empathize from his point of view. And that would be very challenging, but I think it would be really crucial to have to be able to do that. But the one thing I would add to this is that you don't always have to write realist fiction. And you don't always have to write round characters, three-dimensional characters. In fact, you know, in, in some of my fiction and in the, in the fiction of some of the writers I admire, flat characters are important too. Not stereotypes, but flat characters that represent certain kinds of types, certain kinds of uh, characteristics. And so in that sense, if you don't like someone, they can you don't have to empathize with them necessarily, but you can turn them into a type in your fiction if you do it smartly. And there's a, there's a whole realm of possibility for the, for the satirical uh, and the absurdist uh, and, and, and the humoristic in fiction that doesn't need to adhere to the, the realm of empathy. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember in my, my first novel, I had a, a character who I did not very much like. And, and that, that novel was rejected a million times because everybody, could, all the agents could tell that I did not like that character. And they, they all said, why, do you, why are you wasting your time <laughs> behind this story? But I knew that the story needed her, and it took me years to develop empathy for her. And when I did, well, she made, she made me a better writer because I, I was forced to, to learn how to empathize with somebody who I did not like. Nicole, we, we often, um, I mean, we base our writing in fact. So I've written my first piece of fiction that's going to be published in an anthology that Margaret Atwood put together. So I think I'm an official writer now. But, you know, <laughs> when you think about the question of characters and people that you don't like and how you have to write about them, what are your thoughts about them? Because you deal with a lot of them in your writing. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a journalist and I'm an investigative reporter. So I'm always writing about people who do very unscrupulous things. And particularly since I write about race, uh, I'm often writing about people who are in opposition to, you know, everything that I'm trying to uh, gain for my people and, and to me. Um, but the way I deal with that, again, it's, it's, it's going back to the objectivity of method, right? It's like I need to fully understand this person to be fair in my writing and to also understand why they've made the decisions that they're making. So that's not, I think the reason it's important to understand your bias is so that you can report right into that bias. It's, it's when you don't think you have one, I think that you make mistakes and that you do um, not render people wholly or fairly. Um, so. That's that's the techniques that I use, and and I'm not a non I'm not a fiction writer, but I certainly study fiction because I'm a narrative writer. So I do narrative nonfiction and I try to use uh, those same techniques to tell the story. And and the time's running out, but I just want to quickly say, of course, my historical figure is Ida B. Wells. Um, she is, you know, my my guiding light in in so many ways, but also she was very outspoken. She did the type of journalism that people in power did not want her to do, and you know, like like I had sometimes she she paid the price for speaking her mind and and had to learn to control her tongue a little bit. So I I, I try to learn from her, but she certainly I feel like spiritually she has my back. Ida, and there you are in Chicago. Um, all right, well that's it. Oh my gosh, I think I say that at every radio sh radio program. That's it for today. Tune in next time. <laughs> anyway, this has been so beautiful. Uh, Viet, Nicole, and Bolo, thank you for everything that you do for being artists, um, for being truth tellers, um, and for all of you being dreamers. Um, it really was my honor to be in part of this conversation. And I want to just give the power back to all of you who are watching to tell your stories, tell our stories, and to never give up. That's what these three writers mean to me. They are a king and two queens of never giving up. Thank you so much for watching tonight. To Penn, have a great festival. To all the writers, keep on writing. Have a great night. We love you. Bye.